Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Mayor Bowser's pre summit conversation series. My name is Dr. Faith Gibson Hubbard, and it is an honor to serve as the first executive director of Mayor Bowser's Thrive by Five DC. And as each of you, I hope knows at this moment, the countdown is on, um, and you should get excited because Mayor Bowser, um, her third National Maternal and Infant Health Summit will kick off next week. And so we are really, really, really excited and hope that you will join us for the kickoff on Tuesday, September 15th at 2 p.m. This year's theme, Rethinking Our Perspectives, Retooling Our Action, a life course approach to improving maternal and infant well-being is just the challenge we all need to continue to work collaboratively towards healing our communities and improving the well-being of pregnant persons, families, and our babies. All of our babies, we should all be taking responsibility. And the kickoff, as I said before, will be on Tuesday, September 15th at 2 p.m. But you can also expect for the rest of the week a series of breakout sessions from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. each day on Wednesday, September 16th through Friday, September 18th um, that are community led and just really exciting. And so we hope that you will go right now to dcmaternalhealth.com and register because we wanna make sure that you continue to stay connected, not only to the conversations that we will have, but to the great resources that will also be provided through our virtual resource expo. Um, so resources in the district and beyond. And did I also mention that Dr. Anthony Fauci will be <laughs> joining us? I know everybody loves Dr. Fauci. And so we not only need to have him there, but also to have you there as well. So once again, please go on right now to dcmaternalhealth.com and register. So I am excited today to be joined by three amazing colleagues um, who will um, engage with me in a conversation just about um, maternal health in the district and also some phenomenal things that their organizations are doing in this space. Um, so welcome, ladies. It's so good to see each of you. Um, and your partnership has just been um, such a gift, um, not only to the families that you serve, but also to the District of Columbia. And I am so excited to say that our partnership remains strong um, and that shows in this conversation today. So I would love for each of you to just introduce yourselves and um, a little bit about your organization, and then we can get into the rest of the conversation. So I will start with you, Angela, first. Sure. Thank you for that intro, Faith. Really excited to be part of this discussion. So my name is Dr. Angela Thomas. I am the Assistant Vice President for Healthcare Delivery Research with the MedStar Health Research Institute, which is part of MedStar Health. MedStar Health is a large healthcare system in the D.C. and Maryland area. We have 10 hospitals in over 300 other locations where we deliver care. So uh, really excited about this particular conversation because I provide executive leadership for our Safe Babies, Safe Moms initiative, which focuses on maternal and infant mortality in the district. Which is exactly why we are here to have this great discussion today. So thank you so much for your introduction. And Lee? Thank you so much. Um, my name is Dr. Lee Beers. I am a pediatrician at Children's National and the Medical Director for Community Health and Advocacy with our Child Health Advocacy Institute. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Children's National, but we're the largest provider of pediatric care in DC um, with a footprint in all of our communities across the city. Um, and our Child Health Advocacy Institute really works to um, uh, improve care for children across the region. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here with my colleague. She'll, she'll share a little bit more about, about our work as well, but, but together we are leading the Clark Parent Child Network um, and we're, we're in collaboration with Dr. Thomas and her team um, in partnership, I guess. Uh, and we're just so excited to be here to talk about it today. Thank you, and Catherine. Thank you, Faith. Thank you so much for having us. So my name is uh, Dr. Catherine Lamparopoulos and I'm a pediatric neuroscientist. And I direct our Institute for the Developing Brain at Children's National Hospital. Our work really focuses on trying to understand how unhealthy environments uh, can affect the developing child even before birth. Uh, and we're just so excited to be, both Lee and myself are, are so excited to be part of this uh, tremendous uh, collaboration through the, the Clark investment. And we're just thrilled to be here and to share some information about what the next steps are. Thank you. 
Yeah, and thank you for being such great partners. I mean, for the last two years for the Mayor's National Maternal and Infant Health Summit, both MedStar and Children's have jumped at the opportunity to continue to be supportive and to really spread the word about the summit. And that's because of the great work that you do with families every day. I know I'm familiar with both, both MedStar and Children's, um, particularly Children's, uh, as my children like to have things that they need to go to Children's for. Um, I thought I was gonna be there this week. Uh, but, um, but thankfully we were not, but it's great to know that we have such amazing systems right in our backyard. And so I know um, I had originally had the script set up a little bit differently, but I actually want to start with what this particular investment from Clark really means um, to not only your systems, but also to the community. And I think I'll start first um, with my colleagues from Children's. If you want to talk about what does that mean? Um, what does this investment mean? to your system and to the community in which you provide um, services, even before we talk specifically about um, what you're doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'd be delighted to. And, um, you know, the, the, as, as you are, are referencing, um, Faith, uh, the A. James and, and Alice B. Clark Foundation have, have made a really substantive investment in the Washington, D.C. community with the goal of improving maternal and child health outcomes um, for, for children and families across D.C. Um, and I think what's really so exciting about, about this investment is that it really is across hospitals. It's a across um, community-based care providers, it's a, a cross community advocates, really um, for intended for all of us to, to bolster systems, to provide um, the care and support that families need, and, and also really importantly for us to be working together in a collaborative, uh, in a collaborative way. I think um, one of the things that we say a lot in our work is that is that children and families and moms don't live in in silos, they 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 live in communities, and so it's our responsibility as care providers to really be working together within those communities as well. And so we're so excited about about that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, beautifully said, Lee. If I can just add one piece, I think what's really exciting about this network is that it's really going to provide a foundation or a platform for us to really um, spearhead and collectively. Uh, take, bring care, and develop new care models at a level that really up until now hasn't been possible. And from the outset, our goal is to really be able to identify where certain gaps may be within the context of our DC community, both on the prenatal side and the postnatal side. And really our long-term goal is to level the playing field, if you will, identify, you know, which centers, which birthing hospitals um, really ha lack certain resources, uh, human resources or technology, uh, with the goal of really leveling the field within the district and really optimizing and elevating the level of care and the quality of care that we're providing both for moms and babies. And Angela, I definitely want to hear your perspective as well. Sure. I think that the fact that the four of us are having this conversation is truly a testament to the power of, of the investment and just scratches the surface of the possibilities that come out of it. Um, it really is so important because there are so many fantastic, smart people who have been working on uh, reducing maternal and infant mortality in the district for years. And it's a complex problem that you have to look at from several different lenses and with several different stakeholders. And this investment allows for us to bring together platforms, technology, experts in a bunch of different fields, community, you name it, government, you name it, together around the common issue. And so that we can look at the complex problems from all these different lenses and work together to move the needle. If it was easy to move the needle, we would have moved it already. And part of the problem is that lack of funding to be able to have a lot of these, these broad conversations that get into the nitty gritty from a bunch of different perspectives. So I'm really excited that Clark saw the need to do exactly that. And um, not just saw it, but then decided to put some money behind it and invest and believe that when we come together collectively from a bunch of different angles, then we can begin to figure out what we need to do, how we can best support our families, our mothers, and our babies, and ultimately reduce maternal and infant mortality in the district. Absolutely. And 
I think the thing that I love about it the most is that it is really collaboration and innovation and action, right? And I, we have so many conversations all the time. And sometimes I'm in a meeting and I'm like, is this the meeting about the last meeting? And you know, what is, what is actually the, the action that's gonna come out of that? Especially when you are um, a part of those outcomes and seeing those good outcomes. Um, and I've seen that just for myself, even in having my own children in the District of Columbia. And so I'm gonna flip the script again. Um, and in some ways, I just wanna ask just generally, as, as we're talking about really being able to attack this particular issue collaboratively around maternal and infant health and and just the well-being of families the wholeness and well-being of families um you know what are some of these complications that we're seeing or challenges that we're seeing families deal with um, around um, maternal and infant health and from some of these complications and just lived experiences what's the impact on not just the pregnant person and the baby but, but even in their communities. And so I know this is a little bit different of a question. Um, so no need to raise your hand, but I think um, anybody who's willing to jump in, I think just helping to better define what are those complications and really what are we, I think we know there are problems, right? I think sometimes we read articles and we're like, oh my God, black women are just dropping dead, you know, in pregnancy or, you know, and having babies, but it's so much, it's, it's not just that. So what are those complications and the impacts? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to weigh in at least uh, uh, in, for part of the response here. I think what's really critical, and, and, I, and I think I'll take the example of mental health, but I think again, the, the, the connections can be drawn to any other um, problem or uh, medical illness, if you will. But if we take the, the example of um, mental health problems, we know that in pregnancy, mental health problems are now are, are known to be the most common complication of pregnancy. So we know that. We also know that um, the 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 prevalence or the frequency of mental health problems among low-income women of color is twice as high. Um, but importantly, and I think it gets to your your point, we know that there are risks to the to the pregnant women that she's likely to miscarry, that she's likely to go into preterm labor, that her baby can, will be born much smaller. Um, and, on, and for the, the babies or the, the, child, the child outcomes, we know that those children are at increased risk, not just for short-term problems such as attention and irritability, but we know that some of the difficulties that they will experience will touch on them, if you will, across their lifespan, whether it be learning problems, whether it be emotional problems and difficulties making connections, um, uh, attention problems, behavioral problems, et cetera. But I think what's really critical, and I think something that we really need to have at the forefront of our conversations, is that a lot of these problems continue to show that they go from one generation to the next. And so I think, so, and that's really important for these conversations because our goal collectively um, is to not just uh, reduce some of the disparities related to mental health and other health disorders in mothers, in pregnant women today and in their babies today. But broadly speaking, our vision and our goal is really to be able to stop this continuous vicious cycle where a lot of these problems are perpetuated from one generation to the next. So I think that is really one example of how it really touches on communities, but it more importantly, it touches on generation after generation and how these disorders, how these problems just continue to go on and on and on. And so our goal here is not to just deal with the immediate issues or what we're anticipating uh, are some of the longer term issues, but we're looking to develop resources um, uh, opportunities for interventions and for screening that can really allow us to, to, for the very first time, explore ways in which we can really start to, to halt this, um, this spilling over from, you know, one pregnancy or, or one family to the next. And that's a really important point to mention. As this at this year's summit, we will actually have a discussion about intergenerational trauma and that transfer, um, and the importance of looking at things over the life course. Right, not just mom or pregnant person is pregnant, 
babies born. And so we look at that first year. It's, it's really much broader than that. So I think what you've mentioned here validates, number one, that that's a good panel for this year's summit. But yeah. second, um, that it really is about looking much more holistically um, because that problem and that complication around um, behavioral health is so important. I, I, it wasn't until I got into this job um, in this space that I really became attuned to the issues that I had around um, postpartum depression. And I think, um, I didn't know. You just think that you're surviving. Um, but I think really calling attention to that and also that, it's, uh, that there can be community complications and generational complications that persist is really important. So anyone else want to talk about these complications? You know, I think there, there certainly is the clinical component, uh, you know, mental health, physical health, um, just those clinical markers that we want to address in, that we see patterns in across, across cultures, et cetera. But I think it was uh, Lee that speak to, spoke to the patients not living in a vacuum or something like that. And, and that is the truth. You know, when a mom is journeying through pregnancy, she still has to deal with work. She still has to figure out how to navigate a really complex healthcare system to get all of the different appointments that she needs to have. And heaven forbid she has other kids she has to raise while she's pregnant. It, it could be a lot, transportation issues, food issues, all those types of things that ultimately um, affect her way of day-to-day -day living, but also can affect her pregnancy. And then on top of that, when she comes into the healthcare system, unfortunately, we live in a, in a space right now where she can encounter things like implicit bias, she can encounter things like racism and discrimination that ultimately can affect health outcomes. And so how do, we, how do we improve access to care? How do we help her have the resources necessary to deal with the rest of her life that affects her, her pregnancy and affects her ability to raise a healthy family? Um, and how do we um, move the needle on implicit bias, racism, and discrimination? Because the fact of the matter is, as women of color, myself and Faith, on this particular, in this particular conversation, if either one of us thought we were crazy enough to have another baby, we still would, um, uh, statistically speaking, be worse off in terms of risk of having an adverse outcome than, than our, other, our other colleagues. And so why is that? You know? And so we have to kind of look at uh, those factors as well. What happens as we encounter? What happens as women of color encounter the healthcare system? And how can we move that needle so that they have a better health outcome? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thankfully, I'm not going to have any more children, um, <laughs> but, but, but it's right. You know, I joke, but it's, it's so true. I, I know for many women, especially some of my friends who have yet to have children, but are thinking about it, they think twice. Um, no matter what point they're at, they think twice about it because of what could it be. And I think it's just the other lived experiences and really the unknown. Um, and we also don't talk about it. You know, we just don't. We just survive. All moms do, <laughs> all parents do. We're all surviving right now. And I think COVID has definitely given us um, another lived experience for us to see how that survival mode is in action and just trying to get to resilience. So, um, but it gets exhausting trying to be resilient all the time. So I think that's another part that can play into many of the things that we um, just mentioned. So I wanna talk about this idea of integrated services. Um, and, in thinking about the work that you all are both doing across um, your systems um, and together, um, what are some of the integrated services that are really critical for us to achieve first, these birth outcomes that we're, that we're striving toward, right, constantly? Um, so I wanna talk about that first because then I really wanna talk about the connection between those outcomes and then the future for our children. So let's talk about the integrated services that are really critical. You know, one of the things that I am most excited about in, in this project, and I guess this, this reflects my role as a pediatrician, right, is that integration between prenatal and prenatal care and after the baby's born, the postnatal care, and that, that integration, because again, you know, families um, don't 
it's not like you, well, you sort of have one life before the baby's born and then another life after the baby's born, but it's, it's still your same family and community. And, and, and so it's that integration of services is really important as I, you know, was really kind of reflecting on the prior conversation, um, you know, really thinking about, you know, the, the, um, the, the greatest amount, 90% of a child's brain development happens in the first five years of life. And the influences and experiences in that first five years of life, including you know, maternal health and maternal depression and all sorts of other things in the environment and community really impact that brain development. Um, and, and we know that, that, neg that negative and toxic things negatively impact that brain development. And, and Angela, to your really important point, you know, we, there are lots of adverse childhood experiences and the more we know, the more we know that racism and bias is a really important adverse childhood experience that we need to be um, really mindful of and actively dismantling our systems um, that cause that. Um, it, so, but there's also really positive experiences that can imp that that can support positive brain development, and and that is it's that's embedded in this concept called relational health, where the relationship and the serve and return and the inner action and engagement between an infant and toddler and their parents and caregivers is really, really important. And so, so kind of back to your question, Faith, about integrated services, it's that integrating the care of the mother and the child really can support the, the, that relational health. Um, and it can support all of those things that in a family can then help support a child's brain development. Um, because if we, if, if, if we are starting our babies off at, with the best possible foot, that means we're starting our moms off at the best possible foot. It means we're starting our, our neighborhoods and our schools and all of those other things off on the, on the best possible foot. And so it's that, that, that integration between the, across the life courses, I think you said earlier, Faith, which is really important. And if I could add to Lee, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with uh, what she just shared. Um, uh, I couldn't agree more with her. But I think what we have to keep in mind is as obvious, if you will, as it seems and it sounds, um, you know, our, our systems right now, our institutions, our community centers continue to be quite siloed, uh, you know, and so although this makes almost perfect natural sense, right, that we, we would want to develop service models that really uh, maximize the amount of integration um, that happens between, you know, prenatally and then postnatally, both for the mom and the baby. Unfortunately, you know, we, we see this only too often that um, our, our systems, our institutions are, are quite siloed in and of themselves. And so really one of our overarching goals within um, uh, using this Clark investment is to really break down these silos and to really help bring our communities together. I mentioned earlier about trying to level that playing field. We need to understand where the gaps are. We need to know where the strengths are. And then we need to really train our community providers in such a way that we can really ensure that both moms and babies are getting the best possible care, the best possible screening. Lee alluded to this earlier when it comes to babies. Sometimes you know, any problems that they may be experiencing, that may take years to manifest. So we don't want babies and, and moms falling out of our systems, especially when, when we, you know, as Lee mentioned, that there's so much critical development that's happening in the first few years of life. We want to be able to keep families connected, both the moms and the babies. We want to keep them connected into our communities and follow them in such a way that should concerns arise, even as early as possible, our goal is to keep them connected and safeguard both our moms and our babies in such a way that when concerns arise, we can really address them as early as possible through early intervention and other services so that we can really optimize the outcomes, uh, both the health outcomes of both babies and moms. I would just add uh, the beauty of the, the two organizations, MedStar and Children's, having a, coming up with a way to integrate to, to the earlier point about historically there being silos, but it's such a wonderful opportunity and this investment allows us to break down those silos. But I would say even within an organization, there are silos um, working, you know, being now able to integrate in a more effective way behavioral health with women and infant services and with community pediatrics and with family medicine it is powerful. Even integrating our medical legal partnerships 
right there, right there at the point of care delivery, where if there is a what we call a health harming legal need that emerges, something that's going on legally that's affecting the health, we can address it. We can connect them to um, a legal partner that can help them and remove that, that health harming legal need and improve health outcomes. Um, connecting with our community partners. Our community partners are doing a wonderful job of caring for patients who are vulnerable, but they need additional resources, enhanced maternal or fetal medicine resources, enhanced um, ultrasound um, machines and having more of those. Those are things that we can offer as a healthcare system. We can partner, we can collaborate, uh, more education to build the next generation of clinicians. We can partner, we can collaborate. We, we need someone who, you know, organization or community um, organization like a Mama Toto Village who provides wonderful wraparound services to moms and families. Like when we see that need in clinics, being able to right there on the spot, make that referral and that connection, that's powerful. Instead of saying to the woman, figure it out, or I heard about this organization, or uh, you know you need a pediatrician, connecting it right there at prenatal care, more upstream so that when she's now trying to deal with what her life now looks like with a baby, she doesn't have to worry about, oh shoot, I forgot to get that pediatrician connection. I already have them and they've been supporting me along the way. So those are just some, some great examples of how integration across organizations with the community and within the organization can be really, really powerful here. Yeah, I think that's really powerful because um, one thing that you do realize soon after you have a baby is that no instruction manual falls out. You keep looking, but it's not there nor available. And, and you, you don't really know what to do. And I think those great connections, not just the checklist, but the helping hand to get you along. And I think that goes back to bridging this gap. And Lee, you touched on this a bit. Um, you don't know what you don't know with each pregnancy um, or, or when you take on a child, maybe it's not even a pregnancy. You might adopt or you might be taking on a family member um, into your home, um, but you have this baby, right? And so now the birthing part, you know, you, you hope that you've gotten all that guidance, but really that connecting to early childhood development, which is so scary, right? Because once again, you don't know what you don't know. You're just looking at the baby, like, are they doing all the things that they need to be doing? You've already counted all the fingers and toes, but there are a lot of other things that you can't see in that development. So really, Lee, can you talk a little bit about the bridging the gap in that space? As I think that's where a lot of parents build up this anxiety. Many of the things that the perinatal mood disorders and challenges that they may have been dealing with before, it just contributes, it becomes compounding in thinking about what to do next. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. And I mean, I think one of the things that you highlight there is that it's such an it's such an individual circumstance, right? I mean, I I think even even for myself, my husband's also a pediatrician, and um, even the two of us who who presumably have lots of knowledge, right? Both of our two kids were very different, and and we had questions about both of our two kids, and we needed to ask people questions about those things. And so it's really important to have, you know, a whole range and spectrum of supports for families that that range from just hey, you know it's good to see you for your well child check. Let's talk about what to expect and how you're feeling and what things you're thinking about to, oh, maybe there are some questions or concerns that have arisen. How, how, do, we, how do we attend to those and how do we address those? And so, um, you know, there's a couple of things that we're really excited about with our, what, what we call our infant toddler pillar um, in the Clark Current Child Network. Um, um, one of the things we're most excited about is, is a community core that we're developing where we'll be embedding um, essentially sort of family champions um, in each of our, our primary care clinics who will be there to touch base with families when they come in for their well visits um, at, you know, their, their young, for their young kids. Um, just sort of check in, say, you know, what's going on? How are things? Um, you know, the, this, this um, group of family champions will be folks who really know DC and the communities where the clinics are very well, um, who are well connected. And so they can um, be, you know, be, be an ear to, you know, be an ear for a family, but they can also help connect them to really important services in their neighborhoods and their communities and within the hospital. Um, and then from there, actually, we have an, a whole spectrum of additional supports within this infant toddler pillar from consulta psychology consultative services in our primary care clinics, where, you know, we've 
know, have a psychologist come in and meet with a family and say, you know, okay, I know you have some questions about what's going on here. Um, let's think through some strategies um, so that we can support you and sort of think through what's going on, um, just, just to give you a little bit of extra knowledge and support for you, for, to, to arm you with a little bit of extra knowledge. Um, and then that goes all the way up then to we have some additional supports for for families of young kids who are experiencing more significant issues with their kids. Um, we're expanding our early childhood mental health clinic, um, which is huge and we're so excited about that because the access to early childhood mental health services is very limited um, across the nation, not just here in DC. And so expanding those support services is, is really important. Um, and we're also supporting and enhancing our services um, for um, uh, children born to adolescent-headed families, um, as well uh, as, as children who, families who may have concerns that their children have autism or other developmental disorders. So we're just really, you know, thank you for that opportunity. We're really excited about sort of this whole spectrum of, of supports um, uh, that we might be able to offer for families because it really, it, it really is, um, uh, it's really a very individual thing. And, 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 you know, really part of the goal of, for this is that, is that you know, providers and health systems can really be walking hand in hand with families um, and, and learning together. And I think it goes back to the importance of collaboration, right? Um, the collaboration inside of your organization, because I completely agree with you, Angela. I mean, the District of Columbia government is a huge entity <laughs> and we have a lot going on, right? And so sometimes just even with the greatest of intentions, there can be duplication, there could be efforts that could be brought together. I mean, that's part of why I, I have my job is to help bring those things together because there's great work always going on, but it's great to hear about that collaboration internal. But I would love to hear from, because we're getting ready to wrap up, but you know, um, about the collaboration too, because a lot of it sounds like supports for families, but I would love to hear too about how we are collaborating with the family and their level of expertise that they bring to the table. I would love to hear more about that. I can start. So uh, for MedStar and Safe Baby Safe Moms, it is a huge deal that we incorporate community. And when we say community, we mean um, folks from the community and mothers and families and um, those who represent the voices of the, the women and the families we're providing services to. And so that has been so important to us that we've, we've done that in a few ways. One is that community, uh, folks who are delivering care in the community, they are part of, they are partners, true clinical delivery, care delivery partners for Safe Baby Safe Moms. But also as part of our leadership team, we have voices of real mothers, real mothers living in the district with real babies um, who, have, who have gone through real deliveries in the district, some, some positive experiences and not, some not so positive. And having those voices at the table as the leaders, as we are leading the initiative, not just, well, tell us your opinion, we'll see if we'll pick it up. No, your voice matters just as much as my voice matters. And, and let's figure out how to bring our perspectives together collectively to move it forward. So that's one thing. The other uh, thing is our strategic advisory board. And that's a bigger collective of all, a lot of stakeholders in the district who are looking at this particular issue from a, a lot of different lenses. And while that includes providers and governments and payers and all sorts of other organizations, it gets deeper into the families and deeper into the community. And it's really important that that become an iterative uh, uh, conversation where as we begin to implement, as we begin to see results, are we on the right path? What are we missing? What are our blind spots? What did we just do wrong? You know, and how do we correct that? So quality improvement isn't just measuring quantitatively what we see in terms of outcomes, but it's hearing from our families, our moms. Are we hitting the mark here from your perspective? Because at the end of the day, that really is what matters is, are we hitting the mark from your, how did we make you feel? How was that experience when you navigated? Did, did we provide what we intended to provide? We said we made access easier. Was it easier? Um, and how do we make it easier before we even embark on this journey? So that's really important for us. Yeah, so Angela, if I can just build, I think that was beautifully said. And I think that really speaks to uh, the overall Clark initiative, where really the patient voice is first and foremost, and it's really going to help guide 
um, our thinking, our um, the barriers that are identified, um, you know, within the community. We really want the patient voice to be at the forefront. Um, from our end, uh, we have we actually have um, a patient that is co-leading our stakeholder engagement core. So not just a voice, but actually being at the forefront of um, bringing convening um, a DC-wide stakeholding uh, stakeholder engagement core, and really uh, allowing uh, this person to be in a leadership role to really help identify what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the barriers, and then from there, what are you know where is the stigma you know there's so many elements through a number of um focus groups that we've been running over the last six months together with the dc primary care association um where we've really been able to appreciate um you know the the patient perspective what is important to the patient what does the patient want we know what the providers want and what they and what we feel as providers they may need but th their voice has to be at the forefront as we begin to work through issues of mistrust, communication, um, and um, you know, a, a collaborative, a partnership that's not just within our institutions, between our institutions, across the community centers, but that we're really walking hand in hand with the patient. And I think this is really at the forefront of our approach for the DC Mother Baby Wellness Initiative. Our goal is really to have the patient voice help inform the best way to screen for health problems, both physical and mental health problems for moms and babies. And we're really using their voice, um, their experiences to help guide interventions that we're putting together at, at, you know, within the intervention, what is meaningful to them. And so Lee spoke about the community care providers uh, for, the, for the mothers and children to balance um, sort of that side of the coin. Um, uh, as I'm leading the prenatal neonatal pillar of our network, our goal has been to identify what type of navigation systems are women identifying as a critical need. And in fact, they've even named these navigators as uh, maternity care specialists, that this is what they feel should be the right name. And they've actually been able to outline what, do, what should these women be providing to uh, women during pregnancy and postpartum? And what elements of intervention and supports are really needed? So it's really been exciting. It's been humbling. It's been extraordinarily, um, uh, it, you know, exciting to be able to, to partner with these women um, and really give them the voice and give them the opportunity to teach us, for us to learn from them, and collectively to really come together uh, to make DC care, both for moms and babies, a much better place. And what a time this is to be in this space, to be doing this work. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot about my time teaching. I was a middle school teacher, and I thought I was doing a great job. But now that I am learning at home with my children, I definitely realized some of the missteps I made in that partnership, that true partnership with families. And I see so much of that even in, you know, the work that we're doing here together, right? That that partnership, that collaboration is what's really going to drive us forward and really looks at not just health, but well-being, right? And so I think it's just really a time for us to learn so much about ourselves, about our organizations, um, and really how we can continue to drive this work forward. And so I thank you so much for engaging with me in this conversation today. I also thank the people who are not in the room, but have also made this possible, um, the A. James and Alice B. Clark Foundation, um, just for their leadership and really being a part of the community to even know where investing needed to happen, um, because they spent many years um, kind of mining and figuring out what was in that space. And so um, just a huge thanks to them and to MedStar and to Children's National and to you lovely ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, this has been a great conversation and I feel really fired up and further um, validated for the conversations that we'll have at the summit, not only talking about, um, you know, what we should learn during this time of COVID, but we touched on young parents, we'll have a panel on young parents, and also on this life course view of what the transfer of trauma looks like, which is really another thing we really need to dig into. So I appreciate our conversation so much. So thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. Um, you know, I'm excited about the, the summit coming up next week, and I do hope that each of you will go 
onto dcmaternalhealth.com and to register um, and to continue this conversation. I hope that you will also want to reach out to both Children's National and MedStar to learn more about connecting with their work. Um, and we'll make sure to pass that on as well. So on behalf of our very bold and innovative leader, uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser, I want to thank all of you for this conversation today and just for the great reminders and conviction that I felt um, and even more passion that I feel for this work, um, just for this conversation. And so once again, register at dcmaternalhealth.com. Um, the summit is coming up next week, September 15th through the 18th. Um, and if you want to learn more too about Thrive by Five, which I hope you do, um, that you will log on to thrivebyfive.dc.gov and also follow us on all social media handles at Thrive by Five DC. And so while we'll see you next time, I want to also just give another round of thanks um, to my colleagues for joining me today. So thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> All right. Have thank you day. so much.